Hello everyone, and welcome back to another CryEngine 5.7 LTS video tutorial. In today's lesson, we're going to be going over the basics of C++, and we're going to be implementing the magic yellow cylinder. Now, what is this magic yellow cylinder? Well, it's a player. This is a player entity. This is what we use to walk around with our WASD keys, and when we look around with, with our mouse. It's this ability to walk on the beach and have a nice... Uh, Sunday Stroll is made possible by C++ by creating this playable entity. There's not going to be a lot of two-minute tutorials on how to do that. It's, it's quite a lengthy topic, even though me included, I love these two-minute robot voice tutorials, right? Those are the best. Like, hello, today we will be changing the headlight in my 1994 Jeep Wrangler. But anyway... Uh, we're going to jump into this. We have some required software that we need to go over, and the list of the software is rather short. We have CryEngine 5.7 LTS, of course, that is a given for this tutorial. And we also are going to be using Visual Studio in this tutorial as well. You can use any version of it. Um, for this, I'm going to be using 2017. It's a personal preference. Technically, you could use any notepad software, anything you can write script in. For the sake of this, as I said, I'm going to be using Visual Studio. It'll make it easier for you to follow along if you do as well. We also have some main objectives that we're going to be accomplishing during this video, right? We're going to be creating WASD player movements so that we can walk around our map and explore the worlds that we create. And we're going to implement some mouse camera control. So we use the mouse to look around. Now let's twirl that mustache and get really philosophical here. What is a player? made of? In this case, what is a first-person player character made of? That's a big question, but it can be broken down into components, right? The player is made of several components, and each of these components has a different task. First, we have a camera component, which is essentially the eyes, right? This is how the player is going to see. You can change the field of view. You can change the height. You also have the input component, which is technically like the brain or the nervous system, because you press a key, and that signal is sent to register an action. So you do something, it, it does something when you tell it to. You also have the physics component, which is essentially the body. The physics component is seen here as this yellow cylinder. And what this is, is essentially when you walk into a pile of boxes, physically colliding with the boxes and causing them to fall over. And then we have the animation component, which is close to the physics component, but it's a bit more nuanced. It's now, first-person games don't generally need an animation component, right? You can just have this camera uh, that is your head. It's not the player walking. It's how the player walks, right? It's, it's the style. It's the personality. It's the animation. Let's get started. Let's dive into this. The first thing that we want to do is open up the CryEngine launcher. And with the CryEngine launcher open, on the left side, we're going to see projects, and we'll click on that. On the right, we have this blue add button, and we're just going to add project. We want to make sure that the engine version is 5.7 LTS. We're going to launch the sandbox. We will get a pop-up window that will ask us what kind of template that we want to use, if any. Now, there's a lot of options here. We have first person, third person. Um, we also have blank, which we could technically use, of course, but I'm going to use first person here. Uh, make sure it's C++, not C sharp. We're going to name it uh, CPP Tutorial, and I'm just going to be using the first person shooter template because it comes with a character model already. So we don't have to waste our time importing a character model later on. At the end of this, we can just show the work that we've been doing by importing the existing character model. Now, let's close out of CryEngine once that loads because we just wanted to open it so that it generated the folder structure that we're going to be going through. That folder, of course, being the CryEngine Projects folder. Within it, we're going to open up whatever you named your project, mine CPP tutorial, and I'm going to open the code folder. Within that, we have the components folder, and within that, we have bullet H, which I'm going to delete. Spawn point CPP and spawn point H can also be deleted, so we just have these player H and player CPPs. Now, we're going to go to the main directory of our project and right click on the cry project, the dot cry project, and Select Generate Solution. Now, the next window that's going to pop up is going to be a Visual Studio prompt in CryEngine CMake. And just, just select whatever version you want to use for Visual Studio. 
And this should generate a new folder within our CryEngine project directory. So we have this solutions folder now. This solutions folder is going to be the heart and soul of your game project. This is where all of the C++ resides. And this is going to be the folder that we are going to be working in most of this tutorial. So you can also open up this game.sln right from the launcher by going to these three dots next to your project and going down to open in Visual Studio. This game.sln is the only thing we need to open because essentially that's going to open up all of the C++ files you see in this folder in Visual Studios in an organized fashion. So on the right here, we have the Solution Explorer and we have our game solution. And within that, we have all of the C++ and .h files you saw in the solutions folder. Well, now we can open them all in Visual Studio one by one without having to do anything else. They're all right here. So we can modify everything in our game. On the right in our solution explorer, let's open up the game solution and game plugin.cpp. And before we add lines, we're going to start deleting some. We don't want this player reference on this include here. So this component player.h can go away. That's used for networking in order to get a reference to the player. So we can remove that. Then we can go into the destructor down here and we can get rid of this network listener. Down here further in post initialization, we have this ad network client listener. We can just snip that out as well. Even further, we have our m players.clear. We just highlight that, or we can do shift delete on the line we want to remove. Now, if we go down even further, we have all of these you know, iterate over players on client listener and go all the way up to the bool here and just clip those out. Going to keep the cry register singleton class at the bottom and towards the top, let's check what we have. No networking lines, so all, this is all good. So we can hit control S and save this game plugin.cpp. And next we want to open up the game plugin.h because we want to reflect on all the changes that we've made in our CPP. We're going to open up this game plugin.h. With our header open, we're going to start removing networking lines again. And starting from the top, this iNetwork include can be deleted. We can also remove this class C player component underneath it because we will not be accessing our player from the game plugin. The iNetwork client listener in the game plugin class below that can also be deleted, take a hike. Down even further, we can remove all of these lines that are commented under the iNetwork client listener. Below that, this iterate over players can also be deleted. And just in case in the future we need it, we're going to keep this game plugin get instance. At the very bottom, we can remove this map of the players. We don't need that either. So that should be it for the game plugins H and game plugin CPP. Let's save our progress with control S or control shift S to save both of the tabs. And we can try and build this. Um, I think it's going to fail. There's going to be a reference somewhere, but let's give it a shot. That's going to be control shift B. And yep, there's just a in the player class. OK, so we're going to go back into our solution explorer and go to components. And player.cpp. We'll do the same as before and start from the top. We can take away the include bullet.h. We can also remove the spawn point.h, include the last include, the RMI, the it's for remote callbacks. We can just take that out as well. If we go all the way to the bottom of this player.cpp, we can just highlight everything uh, up until the namespace static void. Just delete all of this. This is going to be um, nothing that we're going to be using. So the player.cpp just got a whole lot shorter. Now we'll hit control KO to open up our player.h, our player header. We're going to go to the bottom and just start highlighting. We're going to delete everything up until this reflect type. Then we have all of this networking here in between the initialize and our reflect type. We can take out all these networking lines, this net serialize. So we still have our reflect type, and then we have the constructor and the destructor above that. Up above, we have all of these extra lines, these enums and class, and these are for input flags. So this is all networking stuff that we can take out. So this is our player header. We have a constructor, we have our destructor, we have our reflect type uh, for the includes up here. 
uh, we don't need any of these. So we can remove all of these includes. If you'd like, you can keep these comments. These green ones don't actually do anything. These are just going to be uh, for our sake, so we know what certain things do. And so let's hit Control Shift S to save all of our progress on all of these tabs. And we're going to hit Control Shift B to build. All right, so let's see what we got here. No worries. We got some errors. We're going to troubleshoot here. Uh, all this error is saying, if we go to this line, the registration scope is that it doesn't recognize this class. Uh, so what we need to do is tell it where to find it. And to do that, on the top here, we can just do include. Try schematic. We'll do env for environment. I and registrar dot H. So with that, if we hit control shift S to save and we hit control shift B to build, we'll see if this works and it does. So awesome. We have a perfect build so far. And just to clean this up, uh, we can remove this include the I render aux geometry that is for debugging visuals. And we can also just clip out this mouse delta threshold. So with that built, our game plugin CPP and H are pretty much done. We can just close those out. We're going to be spending all of our time in this player.cpp and this player.h. Let's open up our player.h and this is where the building begins. We are going to start adding lines. Now we're gonna start forming up our header. Uh, common practice is to have public on top for our public accessible members. Then we have protected under it, which is for our inherited members. And then underneath that we have private, which is for member variables or functions that we don't want anything else to access. It's usually done this way because when you read another header, you want to know what other people can do to this class. And that's why these are in the public. Those are things other classes can access and you want to know that first. Protected second because that's stuff you inherited from and private last. This is generally the flow of how most headers are set up. So I just create those ahead of time. So now we want to start getting some components on our player component. And in this case, we're going to have our player component, which is going to spawn all of those components like you saw in the intro. So let's add these components uh, under private. I'm going to do some comments. Uh, camera component is the first one I'm going to be adding. And then I'll be adding the input component for our keys. Then we want something for physics. So in CryEngine, that will be a character controller component. And that'll let us control things like mass. Then we want a mesh and an animation. Uh, in some engines, they're separate, but in CryEngine, these can all fall under the advanced animation component. And those are going to be the four components that we're going to be adding. Now we want to create a variable for a camera component. So we'll put C camera component. And we always want a pointer for our component. So we're going to do M MP camera component. And you'll notice right away that we're, we're going to get some red here. If you hover over it, it says identifier is undefined, and that's because it doesn't know what the class is. That class exists, it just doesn't know what that class is. And a lot of times that means you have to include. So let's just close this off here and go to the top, and we're going to do an include. And you'll see that for most of these components in the includes, the namespace is usually default components. And after that, we're going to look for, uh, we're going to get a drop down menu. But we have cameras, and we know it's probably going to be in there because we're adding it to our camera component. If we select cameras, you'll see that the drop down menu now gives us one of them, and that's camera component. So let's select camera component.h. And if we go back down, it still says it's undefined. Like, oh, is it the wrong header? I don't know. What you can do is go to the camera component and highlight it, and then hit F12. You can go down here to the class, and you can see, oh, it's right. We have it, it's in the header. It is in that header and it's right here, but it's under namespaces. It's under default components. If it's under namespaces, we need to tell the header where to find it under those namespaces. There's two ways to do this. Well, we could do this. We could go down and do using namespace, cry, default components, and you'll see it, that it goes away. The red line went away, but there's a problem with this. The problem with doing this, and this is actually never advised, is that it creates ambiguity. There are other components that have similar names, but have different namespaces. So for example, if you had a camera component.h, but it was under the namespace of advanced components, if you did it using namespace cry advanced components, 
Remember, it had the same camera component .h under the class, but with different namespaces. The problem is you're going to have two camera component classes, and it's not going to know which one to grab. You'd have namespace for both of them, and it's going to be confused. Like, oh, do you want the camera component in default components, or do you want the camera component in advanced components? It's, it's, what you want to do instead is tell it to access it from here. We'll add cry, default components. And yes, it looks a little bit uglier, I guess, but uh, it's more organized this way because it will know exactly where to find your component. We now have our camera added, so let's go ahead and add the input. And we'll start with adding our include first. So we'll just do include default components. And we know that this is going to be an input, so we'll type out input. And we have input component, and we'll select that. While we're up here, we also want a character controller. We'll do include default components. And remember, we wanted our character component to be physics based because that's what it is in CryEngine. So we type in physics. And in the drop down for physics, we have all these different options. We have particle components, you know, area components, etc. Uh, we're going to do character controller component. And we'll also add the include for our animation component. So if we'll do include default components. And the advanced animation component is going to be under geometry. So if we type in geometry, we'll get another drop down menu with all kinds of things that we can select. And there it is, advanced animation component. And remember, these are all going to be under namespaces. So let's get those added. So down at the bottom, we'll do cry, default components, C, input component. Do times and underscore P, input component. We'll close that off. And then we'll do cry, default components, C, character controller component. And the C in this case always means class in CryEngine, so class, character, controller component. And we'll times that by MP character controller. And we'll do cry default components, C advanced animation component. And we'll times that by the MP advanced animation component. All right, so now that we have the variables, they're basically pointers to a location in memory. That's why we use pointers. But there's nothing there. We're just pointing right now to a place that there's nothing there. So we have to put something there. To do that, we need to do it in some kind of function that gets called up on the component. Inherently, there's a lot that gets called in the process of a game. You have things like initialize, uh, gameplay start, uh, reset, update, that kind of stuff. You have one that comes from iEntityComponent, and that is initialize. It's a function that's inside the I entity component, and it gets called every time the component is initialized. So if I just highlight this I entity component and hit F12, you can see what I mean by this. If you scroll down to line 380 and 381, you can see at component creation time, uh, this initializes. So that's what we want. So once we add this component, we want to add the other components immediately. And that's a perfect method to use in this case. So in order to use that method that's in the parent, we just have to call it in our header. So we'll do virtual initialize. Oh, we'll do void, actually. We're going to use void instead of initialize because that's the kind of return, and, well, we're not returning anything, so uh, it's void indeed. And then we're going to do initialize, and after that, we're going to do override. And that's just telling the compiler, hey, we're overriding the method. And now we need to define it in our CPP because we declared it. We want to highlight our initialize and right click on it and select quick actions and refactoring. And then you're going to want to select create definition of initialize in player CPP. And you'll get this nice little blue window, which is actually a window into the CPP file, despite us still being in the header. Now we're going to check it out in the actual player CPP. So you can either click it on the top tab here, or you can use control tab to go back and forth between your current tab and the last tab that you had open. So we need to get or create the components for all of these. We are going to copy all of them and then paste them in the initialize in our C++. And the reason is we're going to do a little cheating here. I'm going to actually turn all of these into comments so they don't do anything. Um, I'm just going to be referencing it because they have long names and it just use them as a reference for which one we're creating. So going down, we're going to type out MP camera component. And that's going to equal because we haven't set it to anything yet, and it has to equal something. We need to grab the entity that this component is going to be attached to. So we'll do MP 
entity. So after our MP entity, we're going to do a pointer, and that's going to be pointing to our get or create component, which is a function inside of the entity, and all entities have this function. We need to go back one and do brackets because it is a template. The way that these templates work is that we use them for generic class references, and then we need to add the class that we want to grab. So we'll do cry default components, C camera component, and then we close it off, and there we go. If when we add this component to an entity, it does not have a camera component, it's going to add it. If it does have a camera component, it's just going to grab it. So that's what the get or create is. It's getting it or it's creating it. If you wanted to get it instead of create one, you could just use get component rather than get or create and so on. So moving down, we're going to do m underscore p input component. And we're going to do equals mp entity pointer get or create component. And then we're going to do the same thing with the template. We're going to do cry default components. And that's going to be. Hmm. And that's why I wanted to copy and paste these up here because I wanted to remember as I type these out. Um, the C input component is what we're going to put here. So let's put our C input component at the end and we'll go to the next line. And as you can imagine, this next one is going to be MP underscore character controller. That's going to be equal to MP entity get or create component, which will be a template of cry default components C character controller component. And then once you close that, of course, at the end, we'll have our MP advanced animation component, which will equal MP entity pointer get or create component template cry default components and of course at the end of this one it will be c advanced animation component and then we'll close that out and we have all of our components so when we add a player component to an entity all these components will now be added so we have these components uh, the only one that we really finished was that camera component so let's get started on this input component so that we can move because right now if we tried this out in our game uh, we would be able to see but uh, there would be no way to move. So let's get cracking on this input component. The way to do this is to use the input component to register actions. So what we're going to do is register an action and then bind an action. Register action means that you're registering functionality to an action map, and then the bind action is registering that input to a key. So let's get started. We're going to do our first key input. We'll do m underscore p input component, and then we'll do an arrow or a pointer to register action. Then we're gonna do parentheses and do quotations. And this name is part of the action map groups and they're just a way to group actions so that you can filter them more easily with the action map system. So we're gonna use player because that's generic. And then we'll do comma and then we'll do another set of quotation. Next we wanna do the name of the action and well, what do we wanna call this action? We're doing movement and we want one of the four movements because you can't bind them all to one, right? You, don't, you can't bind the left and forward movement with the same action. So we want to make sure that we have four of these eventually for the W, A, S, and D. But for this one, we're just going to name it move forward because it's going to be our W key. The last thing it wants is the callback. You can see that on this pop-up here. It says T action callback. And if you ever see that, and you don't know what it expects, then you can type it out and then highlight it and hit F12 and it will take you to it. And you can see here that it is an STD function, which means it wants a type of function or a method. An STD function will mean that there is a pointer reference to it and it wants to not return anything because that's what the void means. There's a couple ways to do this, but I'm gonna do a lambda, which is essentially putting a function inside of another function. And it's useful because it lets you kind of do everything inside of a function. We don't need a whole nother function for it. You can just slip it inside and it makes everything nice and neat. To do this, we need three components. First, we need these brackets. We need these parentheses and then some curly brackets. And that's all you need to do a lambda. Within these fields, the first one is called the CAPTCHA. This is the one that will show you various photographs of a traffic light and ask you to select the ones with buses in them. No, what it needs is anything inside of the class that needs to go inside of the function. It could be nothing. It could be a specific variable. Generally, it's something that needs to go there. I'm going to put this there. 
And what this means is that I'm allowing the entire class to go inside of this function so that it can access any other variables or functions or members or access anything you need. And this is something that you see in a lot of uh, captchas. This, this is, this, you see this, this, this is what the, uh, in the parentheses are the parameters that it expects. So we're going to do int or integer. And then we're going to do activation mode, float value. In the squiggly brackets, that's going to be what happens when the function is called. So basically what happens, the logic. In this case, we want a value. We want to move forward. So in this plane, we have XYZ with Y forward in CryEngine. And we need a value to set to forward. We need a variable for that. Now we could do a float value, but since forward and backward are essentially the same thing when you think about it, uh, one just being a negative value and the other being a positive value. And the same going for left and right. They're essentially the same, but they're opposite of one another. Well, we can combine them. We can ease our workflow. And instead of making a bunch of float values, we can just make a vec2. And this vec2 will reflect both forward and back, both left and right. So in our player.h, we're going to go to the bottom and we're going to create a vec2. And we're going to name it m underscore movement delta. And we'll close that out. And just a side note, this M that we keep using is short for member. Uh, it's C is class, M is member. We always call member variables M underscore, in this case, M underscore movement delta. If it's inside of a function that you've created, it won't have the M underscore. So that's just for the uh, header in the class. So we take our M movement delta and we have it equal to the value that gets passed in. And that's this value right here. Now, even though we're not using activation mode, we still need to have that as part of our parameters. Oh, and we want to add a dot y to the end of our m movement delta. We're making the value that comes in between 0 and 1 for our y. Essentially, the input of the movement delta dot y will either be 1 or the other. It will either be 0 or 1. And now that we have the function, we just need something to call it. We need a key to call it. So to do that, we're going to do a m underscore p input component, and we're going to point that to a bind action. We are binding a key to that action. First, we're saying what group that we're accessing, and we're accessing our player. Next is the action that we want to call, and in this case, it's going to be the move forward action. And we're going to want to type out lowercase e, all caps, a, i, d. And we'll get a couple options here. So you'll see Xbox pad, PS4 pad. And this is asking us what kind of device that we're using. Uh, we're going to do keyboard mouse. So E A I D underscore keyboard mouse. We'll do a comma. And then the next line is going to be asking us more specifically what key we want to use for this action. You type out lowercase e, capital K, capital I, and we'll get options for every key on your keyboard and then some. Uh, we're going to do W, which is, of course, the universal move forward key, unless you're an absolute cretin spawn and want to use the up arrow. But uh, yeah, we're going to use the W key here. So E, K, I underscore W. Now we're going to close this off and finish this. But if our game did have networking, you would see something like this where it's true, true, false, which is essentially saying that the input is true on press, it's true on release, and it's false on hold. Since we're just making a single player game, we can just get rid of all that. In fact, if we hover over it here, you'll see highlighted is bool on press equals true. So it's always going to be true, even if we include this or not. You're allowed to do that with functions. And since this is by default at true, and we don't want to change it or modify it in any way, we're just going to leave it as is. And that is going to be it for our moving forward input. Now, something I like to do is copy and paste uh, both of these lines. So we have this register action, this bind action. Let's just copy that, and then we'll paste it one, two, three more times. So we have four lines. And as you can see where this is going, we're going to be changing each of these lines to reflect a different key. So instead of move forward on this second line, we're going to change this to move back. And we'll change the move back in our bind action. Underneath this, we'll change this one to, well, let's just do move right. And then we'll change move right. And of course, we want to move left for this last one. Now, for our move back, the only difference between the move forward and the move back uh, is going to be the key press, but also this value. We want to change it to a negative value because it's the opposite of moving forward. Change this to S. 
for our right, we'll change that to D, and for our left, we'll change this to A. Now, we also want to change the value of our A or our D. I think it's the A is going to be uh, moved to the left, so that's going to be negative value, um, the opposite of right, of course. So now we have our inputs, and they're modifying the value, but that's not actually moving the entity yet. In order to actually move the entity, we could do something like MP entity dot set, uh, what is it? Set position, uh, set pos, which is just short for set position. We'll do some parentheses here and then do MP entity point to get world position plus vec3. Create some more brackets, and then we're going to do m movement delta dot x times m movement delta dot y, a comma, and then we'll do 0 0.0f, which is 0, or you can just type out in all caps 0 if you prefer. It's the same thing. And then we're just going to close this line out. What exactly is this line doing? Well, it's getting your current position, and then it's adding these values to the current position which is what you want, because if you got rid of the get world position, it would set the values based off of zero and not the world position. So unless you're making a geocentric game where you are the center of the universe, uh, in this case, the values would be getting added to yourself, which is what we want. Or do we? Because first of all, in this case, our entity is moving, and there won't be any physics because it's not the character component that's actually moving, it's the entity. Essentially, what we've created so far at this point is something you might be familiar with would be a no clip camera, something where you can clip right through your walls, fly at absurd speeds, and in other words, act like a god. But we are not making a god, unfortunately. Also, we're only putting this in the initialize. So we only call this once when we have our component initialized. So right now, it isn't really going to work yet. What we need is for this to be called in an update. In game engines, you have updates called, you know, 60 times a second, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the game engine, of course. And that refresh, that update, constantly checks for any changes. And oh boy, that's exactly where we want our movement, because we want responsive controls that are always being updated and not at all in our game initialize. To do this in CryEngine, we have events. We have, we have event Gameplay started, we have event reset, we have event update, we also have an event initialize, which is different than the initialize we have here, and we're actually going to add that later to fix something that we're going to run into. There are events for physics, collisions, animation events, there are events for everything. So to get access to these, they're all part of the iEntity component. So if we just highlight our iEntity component up here in our C player component line and hit F12, we'll see all of these. And if we go into here and we scroll down, we know that it's events that we want. And we can see here that one is called get event mask. And above it is one called process event. Get event mask is what's called by the engine every time it reads the component. And it's checking to see if there's any events that it wants to register that component to or that the component wants to register to. So you use that to say, hey, engine, I want to listen for uh, an update event or this event, or that event, and once the engine has that, it'll register as part of that, and every time those events get called, it will call the component. And then the process event is what gets called when those events get called, and then you do the logic for them. How to do that is we need a virtual, because that means we want to have a child be able to change it. This one does have a return, so if we go back to our iEntity page, you can see here cry entity event flags, and that's what it wants back. That's what the engine wants to know what events you're listening to. So I'm just going to paste that in here, but you can type that out, cry entity event flags. And if we F12 on event flags, and these are all of the event flags. These are all of the events that you can listen to. Hidden, unhidden, reset, initialize, timer expired. The list goes on. So after our event flags, we're going to do get event mask. And we're going to do a const after that, or a constant, which means the function signature cannot change. It is a virtual function that we are overriding. You know, you don't want to register for gameplay started and then have the engine switch it to update on you because of some bug somewhere or something. But doing it this way ensures that the possibility of that happening are zero. By doing const, it won't even let you. So this is just a way of double sealing your doors. 
Next is process event. So we're going to do virtual. This one doesn't return anything. We're just listening. So we're going to do void. Next is process event. And it did have a parameter, which if I F12 on get event mask, let's see here. So the bottom line. All right. So inside of our I entity component, process event. Okay. That's the one. So from this error, we can deduce that it wants a const S entity event. And there's that const again, which means when we get this entity, we can't modify it. So whatever entity the engine sends us, we can't change it. We can only do some logic based around it because you don't want to change the event that it sends. So that's the event it wants in there. I'm going to copy and paste that whole line right into the process event in our header. And then we're going to end that with an override because we want to let it know that we're overriding the parent. Now highlight the get event mask and right click on it and do quick actions and refactoring. Create definition of get event mask. There it goes, it creates it. Now we're going to do the same thing here with the process event. So with those made, now we need to tell it what event flags. Return is how to return a variable whenever it wants something back. Whenever it's not void, it wants something back. So if it's bool or int or in this case, cry entity event flags, it wants that back. So for this, we're going to get rid of this event flags and we're going to do E event and the event we want is update. So there we go. So we're going to say, hey, this is the event we want to listen to. And below it in process event could do an if event dot event equal cry entity E event update, because remember, it's going to send you every event that you've registered for. So you're going to have to do logic based on whatever event that is because that one method gets called for every event. So if there was a gameplay update, this function is called. If there was a initialize, this function is called. But we want to know why that function was called. So in this case, if it was the update that called it, and that's the only thing that's going to call it because that's the only thing we registered it to, then we need to do some logic. But so since there's so many events that we may be listening to, you're going to have a lot of if statements. So if event dot event, and then I do, you could have a list of if statements, but we could also more simply do a switch statement. So instead of if, we're going to get rid of this whole if here in our C player component, and we're going to start over uh, this if statement with a switch. So the switch statement will go through all of them, and then it will stop when it finds the right one. It won't waste time calling all of the others once it's found what it needs, which you could, of course, fix with switch statements, but switch is just going to be easier in this case. So we're going to do switch bracket event dot event. You could call it event param or parameter because this isn't the actual event and it's just the parameter, but the actual event is part of the class. It's sending us a variable s entity event and that variable has a property called event and that event is one of the ones that we're listening for. It is the one we're listening for in this case, it's update. So we're going to do some squiggly brackets and we're going to try and access this event within this event class. And that's why we do event dot event. So the one that we're listening for is a case. And the case is always how you want to start your switch statements. And we'll do cry entity e event update, just like in the one we're listening for. And we'll end it with a colon and not a semicolon because it's a case. We don't need to. It's just nice, uh, especially when we add more lines. It shows you where the end of the case is. And we also need to add a break at the end. And this you do need to add. So. Always end your switch case with a break, and there'll be a semicolon after that. So what we want in here in our case is, so if we just highlight this MP entity set position, we're just going to, you can hit Control X to cut and copy that, or you can just highlight it and do Control C, and then we're going to paste it right here, and that's going to be it. So we're going to hit Control Shift S to save all of our tabs here, and then we're going to hit Control Shift B and build this and see if there's any errors. Any errors? Oh, lordy. All right, so what do we got here? We got a STD function, use class temporary files. Uh, okay, so I didn't delete this line. There's a line in here in the game plugin.h uh, that I didn't delete. It's the helper function to call the specify callback, so the iterate over players line. And it works. So yeah, just that game plugin.h, that was the problem. Um, that's why we like to build things, read the errors. So everything is built successfully now. We're going to go ahead and test this in CryEngine Sandbox. Now, don't get your hopes up. This is not some pinnacle of game. 
uh, character design, but we're going to get an idea of what this character is going to look like and what we've built so far actually does. Uh, if we click this local Windows debugger on the top here, it'll launch our game project, but we actually want to open it in Sandbox. So in our Solution Explorer on the right, if we right click on this editor down here. When we click this gear, it says set a startup project. And then we click the local Windows debugger. Well, that's going to load it up in Sandbox, and that's exactly what we want. So uh, once Sandbox is loaded, we can just go to the levels, example, if you haven't built a level yet. And we'll just get this, you know, rough, rough level here. Um, we're going to delete the spawn point since we don't need that. We're going to drag an empty entity in here and just name it player. We're going to do add component down here. And we should see this C player component. And that's what we made. That's, that's our player. Um, and you can see all the components that we've added. We have our C player component, our camera, our input, our character controller. Um, but, well, there's some problem, right? Because we have to first make sure that we have a... Hmm, yeah, it's not doing too hot. So it's flashing here. This black and flashing is just me moving my keys around. So let's see if we can find this error. If I go through my input controls... Ah, uh, there it is. So my movement delta is all set to Y. Um, there's an X axis, of course, because we multiplied M movement delta X and Y. So we need to change those to X, our left and right, and we'll rebuild that. And that should fix it. I think that's going to fix it, that little bug there. Um, so if we play our example level, oh, we've got to start it. Uh, it built correctly. So we're going to start up CryEngine and let's see. We'll go to levels, go to example. So there you go. It zips around, um, goes through walls. It has no regard for physics. So that's the kind of that God mode camera that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, it's not really a player. It's just kind of a, a thing, camera that decides that it wants to zoom around. But regardless, there's also another problem because you could see that when I started the level, it did that weird input thing. It kind of flashed a little bit. I don't know if you caught that. So that just means that when the level's starting, something is going on. Um, at least when I started it for the first time, because as you can see here, this is, well, this is our player so far, but we're getting there. So we have input and it's responding to, to what buttons we press, but this is cool. We have an idea. We have our entity here. So we have gravity until we start moving, but we also just move through stuff, as I mentioned, and we don't want that, right? We want a physicalized component. And right now this is just the entity moving. This is, uh, the C character controller is not interacting with our player at all. So we want to make sure that happens, and let's save our progress in CryEngine Sandbox and close out of it. We're going to hop back into our player CPP and player.h in Visual Studio. And to do this, well, it's really easy to do. Instead of our MP entity down here in our event update, we're going to do MP character controller. We're going to point that to a set velocity, which is, well, it sets velocity. There's also add velocity for something like a racing game that you want to keep uh, perpetually going faster and faster, but we're going to do set velocity since we want to just walk around. And then we can do the VEC3 again. We'll do a parentheses and we'll do our M movement delta dot X, comma, M movement delta dot Y. And at the end, we'll do 0 dot 0 F, and that would work. It would move forward, X, left, right, Y, etc. Although one big glaring issue with this is that we don't have a speed to reference. We don't have any kind of speed at all in this, and we need well, to add, I'm just going to say it. I have the need. The need for speed. Okay. All right. You're done. Get out of here. We're just going in the direction of one, and that's kind of problematic. Another problem is we have values that are getting set, but they don't always reset to zero between gameplay and stuff. So you could have some weird input issues. I think that's why that screen was still blinking, even though I fixed that bug before. Um, it's... But before I get ahead of myself, let's add some speed. To do that, we're going to create a member variable, and that's going to be in our player.h. So we'll go down, and it's going to be a float, because if you've ever multiplied a vector by a float, well, you get a speed. For our float, we'll do m for member underscore move speed. Or actually, I'm going to name this movement speed. Uh, make sure it's camel case, like our movement delta, so it's a capital S and speed. 
we'll close that out. We could assign a specific value for our speed here, but we want to make sure that we can edit this later. So if we assign a value for our speed now, the problem is, is if we don't like that speed or want to change it for any reason, well, we have to open up our solution again. Um, so we're going to make this so that we can just change our speed on the fly in the editor in as one of the player variables. So to do this, we need to do that through this reflect type static function call. This here allows you to reflect any properties that you might want to modify in the editor. To do that, we'll do desk.addMember, and then we're going to do parentheses, and then we're going to add an ampersand, then we're going to do C player component, then we're going to do a double colon and do M movement speed, and then it's going to want a ID. And for this, it takes characters, so we're going to want to use two apostrophes rather than two quotation marks three to four letters that describe what we're trying to do here. So I'm just going to do PMS, player movement speed. We'll do a comma and quotation marks. And within those quotation marks, uh, this is the name used internally for the engine. So player move. Actually, I'm going to get rid of the spacing here and the capitalization because that is not allowed in this one. And this next one is actually the label. So this is what you see in the editor. So for this one, I'm going to do capitalization and spacing. I'll just do player movement speed. We'll do a comma, and then we'll do another pair of quotation marks, and this one will be the description. So I'll just do sets the player move speed for that description. The last thing that it's going to want is a default value. So we'll do a comma, and then you can do zero. Um, you can do 0.0f. 0 .0 I'm just going to set this as zero by typing out zero in all caps. So that will put this in the editor for us to modify, but we need to apply it to our speed. So what we could do is just come in here and add it, but a better way to do this is create a variable that we can modify. Under update, we'll do a vec3 and we'll do a we'll do a velocity. And then we'll create it using our value. So we'll equal vec3 parentheses m movement delta dot x, comma m movement delta dot y. and then 0.0f at the end because we don't want to move up or down with our forward and backward movement. But what you could do is velocity times equals velocity times movement speed, uh, but since it's kind of redundant and we like simplicity, I'm just going to do velocity times equals movement speed because that's the same thing. So times equals is the same as equaling something and then time, you know, right? It's, it's almost like we're doing math here. Hmm. So I'm just going to do this times equals, oops, uh, let me fix this, hold on. So yeah, velocity times equals m movement speed, and we'll close that out. So this works, um, but we're going to have some issues, uh, two issues to be exact, and the first issue, uh, we're going to move based off of the inputs, but it's not going to be relational to the controller at all, just kind of like our entity. So to fix that, what we're going to want to do in this case is we're not going to want to get the position because the way the controller works is that it automatically adds velocity to the position, so we don't need to get the position. What we do need to get, though, is the rotation. So we're always moving based on the direction that we're facing. To do that, we're going to get rid of this VEC3 velocity line here in our e event update. So we'll do an MP entity dot get world rotation. And then the function, which you're going to want to do parentheses. Whenever you multiply a quat by a vector, it gives you a forward movement. Or, well, it'll automatically move you based on the forward rotation, rather. An issue with this, though, is if you press forward and move right at the same time, uh, your character would move 1.4 times faster than they would if you were just going forward or just going right. And I'm sure many of you have played games in the past where Instead of sprinting straight across a field, you kind of do that sideways diagonal shuffle because it's quicker. And it's 1.4% quicker because of some vector math. But thankfully, there are new lines in C++ and in most engines that can fix this. So to fix this, we're going to add a line here. We're just going to do velocity and we'll do a point to, or actually we're going to do a dot here. I don't know why I did that. Um, so velocity dot normalize. And we'll close that, and that should fix it. That's going to fix, that's going to equal it out. So when we run diagonally, it's just going to equal 1 now instead of 1.4. We could also, let's see, 
Um, we can actually add our M movement speed to our key character controller line so that we can clean this up even more and get rid of this velocity times equals M movement speed. So now it's all in one place. It'll do this times rotation. And there we are. Now we have our movement in our forward, back, left, and right movements. So we'll hit Control Shift S and then we'll do a Control Shift B to build. And let's see, we got no matching token found. Um, hmm. Let's see what I missed here. So uh, if I go through, let's see if I can spot the error. See if you can spot it before me. Oh, yep, there it is. It's this bracket. So if I build this again and build successful. So it was the squiggly bracket. I didn't close that out. Um, let's test this out in the engine. So we'll do load and we'll do levels we'll do example we'll load this example level and let's see how this is so if i test this out set a movement speed before we test it out so at the bottom here in our c player component we have this new input i'm going to do three uh, five is pretty good too three is kind of nice walking speed so nice this is much smoother it's much better it's starting to feel much more like an actual player uh, albeit the camera's a little low to the ground, I guess. And uh, yeah, we can't look around. So our player movement with our keys is looking fantastic. So let's hit Control S. We'll save our project. And let's start getting even more into this. So we have our player key movement. Um, there's a few things I actually want to move around in here before we get to the mouse, but that shouldn't take too long. Uh, let's see. Let's open it up. So I do have one problem that doesn't really show on this tutorial because there's no camera on my keyboard. But uh, when I first test my level in CryEngine, I have to hit a couple of keys of WASD a couple times before the inputs start to actually register. And I think that is because of where our register actions are currently in our CPP file. They're in the initialize line, and I suspect that they could be somewhere a bit better because they're only being called upon during the initialization of the component, not after it. So, hmm. Yeah, so these keys right here, these register action, bind action inputs, these need to be registered when the game starts, not when the component is initialized. The component needs to be initialized when the component, well, it's initialized, but not the actions. The actions need to be initialized at game start. And while we have an initialize for C player component, there is another initialize, and that's the initialize for when the game starts. So we're going to listen for that event. We're going to do cry entity e event initialize. We are not going to be using a semicolon to separate these like our update. Since these are two separate flags, we're going to be using a bitwise or, which is represented as a pipe on your keyboard. And now it will return both of these. And of course, now we need to add the case. So under our switch, we're going to do case, cry, entity, e event, initialize. Now we're going to add some squiggly brackets. And within these squiggly brackets, we're going to copy all of our input keys, all of these register actions and bind actions, and we're going to put them right here. So we have our void with our switches, and we have our initialize case, which contains all of our input. And what this will do is it makes it so, as I mentioned before, our inputs are now registered at game start and not when the component is initialized, which is what you want to do with input registration. So with that input put in our initialized line, if we control shift S to save, control shift B to build, and then we test this in CryEngine, uh, we should just have a smoother overall time. Um, another thing you might notice if you have this problem is sometimes you might have to keep deleting your player entity to get your updates to work. Um, but in this case, we won't need to. We can just keep keep the player as is. So yeah, all right. So the player smooth right on the get-go. I didn't have any lag uh, or just I didn't have any problem with the keys not registering right when I started. So far, so good. It's really smooth. Key movement's responsive. It's initializing when it should be. Uh, so let's save this. We're going to hit Control S and save that. Back into our CPP file, we are actually going to rename initialize gameplay started. And then I'll rename it in the return as well. So the event that it's listening for is also gameplay started. 
Um, I just want to fix this so it works on the first go. So we have our gameplay started. Um, we have our movement delta being reset to zero. Let's see what else. Oh, another good practice to do is to reset variables to zero. So I'm actually just going to add a line here underneath our initialize case. Uh, it's just going to be m movement delta equals zero and close it. And it's just a good habit to get into to reset variables when the game starts. Um, so nothing is left over. So, um, hmm. We have our movement delta being reset to zero, uh, which is actually, let's, again, let's move this as well. A better place for movement delta being reset to zero would not be in gameplay started, but actually in reset. So we go up to our return line. We're just going to add that as well. So, and we're going to add cry entity e event reset, and we'll close that out. And this is going to help because reset is actually called before gameplay start and when it's ended. So, in fact, there is an execution lifestyle here in our crydocs. And as you go down this graph, you'll see that the levels loaded in sandbox, the you know editing mode, the event reset, and then there's the start game, the exit game, and then an event reset. So as I was saying, this event reset hits both when the game starts and when the game ends. So with that knowledge, we are going to go back to our CPP and we are going to listen to that event. So we're going to add it here at the bottom. We'll go under our last break and we are going to type out case cry entity e event reset and then we'll do colons to close it and this is our case this is our reset case uh, we're going to put some squiggly brackets underneath that and of course as you might have guessed we're going to go up here and cut out our movement delta equals zero and plop it right down into our reset case let's now go into here into our player header and we have all of our components Oh, we could, well, first we can get rid of these comments here, these green ones uh, for our components. Uh, I don't need to reference those anymore. And then I have my private functions and my private member variables. The functions, we're not returning anything, we're just calling. So we're going to do void. We'll name this initialize input. So this will be our function name. Uh, we're not getting this from the parent. We're actually creating this function ourselves, which means it will turn this green underline so we're going to highlight initialize input and right click on it and we're going to select quick actions refactoring and then select create definition of initialize input in player CPP. And then we're going to go back into our player CPP and we're going to copy all of these input components again and we're just going to paste them back in our header in our initialize input function. But as you can see where we're pasting it in our header is actually still it's in the player CPP but this is for organization so we can see in our header, we have our initialize input function, and then we can uh, modify it from right here. So we're just keeping things organized. And because of this, uh, we're going to paste our initialize input function into our gameplay started. So every time the gameplay starts, our input is initialized. And now with our inputs working, they're really smooth. We can modify the component so that we can change our speed, the initialization order of all of these inputs are in the right spots in our C++. So there's not going to be any unexpected bugs. So everything is looking good in terms of the key controls. So let's take this up a notch and we're going to add some mouse movement to our player. All right. So to get started with this mouse, uh, we want to do what we did with our key first. So we want to add a action for our mouse to be registered to. So we'll do MP input component register action and we're going to put this in the player group and this we're going to call we're going to call it yaw yaw in this case is going to be left right mouse movement uh, rotations and next we're going to want to create our lambda which is the same as the other inputs so this uh, integer activation mode float value and then we'll close it off we're not going to put anything in there just yet The EKI is going to be mouse Y. 
Uh, we're going to do the same thing we did with the other components as well. So we're going to copy both of these lines and paste it. And essentially, it's going to be the same thing, but for the pitch. So we can go through that and change yaw to pitch. And mouse Y is going to be mouse X on the EKI. And now we have a variable for both the X and the Y axis. So back in our header, we could do a float mouse X and a float mouse Y, but why do two when you can do one and combine them? So we're going to do a vec two. And we're going to name this one, uh, we'll name it mouse delta rotation. We'll close that. And now we just want to copy it. So highlight it and copy our mouse delta rotation. And we're going to paste that into the input component for our yaw. So in these squiggly brackets, we'll put our mouse delta rotation. And then we're going to want to add to that. So we're going to do dot x. And then we're going to do equals negative value and close that out. Next, we're just going to copy our m mouse delta rotation dot x equals negative value line and paste that into our pitch line. So we have this on both our yaw and our pitch input register actions. And I goofed it already. I'm sure you probably saw that. The mouse delta rotation dot y for our yaw and mouse delta rotation dot x for our pitch. So they're both negative value, but the only difference is the dot y and the dot x. So down here, we have our player movement. And what we could do is create another function. After initialization, we could do uh, player movement. And I'm just going to leave a comment here. So it just says player movement. And that's how I'm going to know that these lines below it are the ones that I'm going to want to put into the function that we make. So let's make this function. First, we're going to go to the header. We're going to go down below our initialize input. We'll do a void and we'll name it player movement and we'll end that and close it and hopping back into our player CPP at the very bottom, we'll do void C player component player movement, no parameters, nothing else we need to write. We could of course right click on our player movement in the header and do create implementation, but this is just how you manually do it. And we're going to copy all of this text underneath the player movement comment, this vec three and we're going to paste these three down below. So they're in our function. And again, we're separating things in the CPP. So it's organized and things are getting called at the right time. So that's there. Perfect. Uh, let's do some rotation now. So to do rotation, to get rotation, we want to take the current rotation or whatever direction that we're facing, and we want to apply a value to it. To do this, well, first of all, we want to take the rotation, which is a quat, and we need it to be in an easy and adjustable x, y, z. And an x, y, z can be done in an angle three or an ang three for short, which is what we're going to type out here. Let's call this one uh, rotation angle. And to get that, we do equal and we can access the camera class. So we'll do C camera. And we'll do double colons here. And let's see what functions we have. We have create angles based off a of quaternion. So create angle y pr. And this allows us to create angles based off of a quaternion or a quat. It actually wants a matrix 3-3, three, three, but there are ways to convert a matrix 3-3 three, three to a quat. We can do this by typing quat and then giving it whatever matrix 3-3 three, three you want to switch to a quat. And our rotation that we want is get world rotation. So we have our quat, we have mp entity, and we have our get world rotation. And hmm, I have so many brackets here. I got to, let's see. Oh, no, the rotation is the quad. So I got to put a matrix 3, 3 here. And so we have our ang 3, we have our matrix 3, 3, and there it goes. Our arrows go away. So what this is doing is it's getting the rotation of the entity, and then it constructs a matrix 3, 3 out of it, and then it puts it into angles that we can modify. So we'll do rotation angle dot x below it. And then we could do plus equals mouse delta rotation dot x. And now on the x axis, it will modify by that. And then we do rotation angle dot y plus equals mouse delta rotation dot y. And close that. And since it's an ang3, we have a rotation angle dot z as well, our third axis. But we're going to set this one to zero because we're not doing any rolling today unfortunately. So we have that. And what we can do after is uh, we need to set the rotation. And at the bottom, if we do MP entity set rotation, it allows us to input a quaternion. 
we created an angle, but we need a quaternion. So essentially, we need to convert this back to whence it came. Fortunately for us, this C camera above, uh, this class will convert a matrix 3-3 to an ang3 if we give it one. So this one will actually do the math for us. So we'll do const quat. It's going to take in the rotation. And we'll do final rotation. And this is going to equal uh, C camera, the class. And we'll do create orientation YPR. Make sure it's create orientation YPR. I have admittedly goofed it on this and done create angles YPR in previous runs uh, because it's right above it. And I got a little bit confused. So I'll just double check. So we know we need a quat, but we're going to get a matrix 3 3 back. We're just going to add quat before our C camera. So let me slow this down. There's a lot of converting and sifting and going through different angs and quats and whatever. But simply put, is this all takes an angle three, it converts it to a matrix three three, and then we convert this to a quat. It just needs the parameter, which is what we want our rotation angle to be. So we'll put rotation angle at the end, and then we set the quat here. So just like this, final rotation. We have mouse movement. We haven't set how fast we want it to move or anything like that. So just like our in-player movement from before, we're going to add some variables here so that we can modify this in the engine. So let's add another. We have Del's, uh, Del Del's. We have mouse delta rotation. So we'll go below our M movement speed and we'll do a float and we'll do M rotation speed. So this can be modifiable. Just like our previous modifiable variable, we also want to do a description and add member. Do parentheses, ampersand, C player component, M rotation speed, comma, and we'll do PRS, player rotation speed. And again, we'll do player rotation speed. For the description, we'll do set the speed of the player's rotation. And we want to make sure that it's also zero. So we have our mouse delta rotation dot x and dot y both times by the rotation speed. So let's hit control shift s and then save all of these tabs and then we'll hit control shift b to build. And let's see if we have any errors. Um, it's just tense part. Oh, no errors. All right. So. Let's launch Sandbox with the local Windows debugger button and fire this bad boy up. So our Sandbox is loaded. Let's just go into our levels example. Uh, we have our player component here. Uh, still very much a player component. Uh, if we go down in our properties, we see we have a player rotation speed now, which I'm going to set to 0 0.002 because it's very sensitive. So it likes very low numbers. So if we move around with our WASD and we can look around. So not bad. It's definitely freedom of movement, but it also, as you can see, it's very jittery. And the reason for this is because we're basing our mouse rotation off of the actual world rotation right now and trying to modify it on the fly. When you've got things like physics trying to affect the entity, you don't want to try and change the actual world rotation. What you want is a variable that you can modify and then set the rotation to that variable. It keeps it consistent and it gets rid of that awful jitter. So let's go do that. In our header, we're going to create a new variable. It's going to be a quat. And we're going to name this look rotation or now let's name it look orientation. So M look orientation. So with that added first, we want to make sure that when we reset our game, our look orientation also resets. So we go to our case for reset and under our movement delta zero, We'll do m look orientation equals identity. Identity is actually identical <laughs> to zero, except that it is zero rotation in all the axes. And while we're here, I'm also going to add our m mouse delta rotation equaling zero in our reset, because we, we want all of these things to reset at the beginning. We don't want to get some funky errors, especially when you're in sandbox and you quit in the middle of a, a jump or something. You'll notice your camera icon will just be spinning like crazy. So yeah, we don't want that. It's just a good habit to get into to manually reset certain things that you want to reset because the engine won't reset things for you. And it will call for the reset, but it won't know what to reset if we don't tell it 
what to reset. Okay. So let's go into here in our ang3. And instead of getting the world rotation, and we'll put in m look orientation. And we can get rid of this mp entity pointer. So let's just get snip that out. And I have an error here. What's this red line for? Uh, oh, too many brackets. So let's trim those out. And I also want to swap this consquat final rotation for our m look orientation. So I'll just paste that in there. And this final rotation as well can be m look orientation. So we're getting quite close. We have our smooth key inputs. We have smooth mouse movement. But there's going to be one problem that we run into, and that's going to be the rotation looking up and down with the mouse. We'll be able to do it, but as soon as we raise our camera from the initial ground level height, it's going to start pivoting on that same 0, zero uh, location that it originally was. So when you look down, your camera is going to kind of like move forward and down if you can like you're going to pick something up or in front of you rather than just tilting your head down. So to fix this, we want to set the position that we want the camera. So what we'll do is underneath our quad look orientation, we'll create a VEC3 and we'll name this one M camera default position or POS. I think it is in, in yeah. So camera, def cam camera, camera default POS. I say default because the camera position might change, but we just want a default position where we will expect the camera to always be. And like our movement speed and our rotation speed, we also want to be able to modify this camera position as well. So we're going to add a member and do ampersand C player component. We'll do two colons and do M camera default pass. And you know where this is going. So I'm going to do CDP for camera default position. And we'll do camera default pass followed by camera default position. And I'll describe it as sets camera default position sure and to nobody's surprise this is going to end in zero so close that out where do we want this to be well in our cpp we want to do this every time we reset it because if we change the camera at any point in the game we want to play again we want it to go back to the default position so underneath our reset let's do mp and we know it's a camera component so a camera component we'll point it to set position uh what options do we have to set field name. Ah, okay. So set transform matrix is what we want here. Well, we know the transform is the position, the rotation, and the scale. Okay. So let's see. Well, this seems complicated, but it's not. Um, we need a matrix 3, 4. And what we can do is create a matrix 3, 4. So just above it, we'll do matrix 3, 4. And we'll do cam default. Uh, matrix so cam default matrix and there's no m because it's not a member variable it's a local variable specific to this function and now we've created a variable we have a matrix 3 4 and basically it's going to be filled with nothing so we need to access it and if we access it with this camera default matrix dot and now we have all these options for this matrix 3 4 and these mostly look like a whole lot of nothing but what I mentioned before is that we have our position, which is our translation, we have our rotation, and we have our scale. And those are the three components of a matrix 3, 4 that it wants. So first we want our position, our translation. If we type in translation, we get set translation. This takes in a vector 3, or vec3, so let's put in our M camera default position. We have our position, so let's do rotation. We'll do cam default matrix dot set rotation three three because it's going to be a matrix. And in there, we're going to do MP entity, and we'll point that to get world rotation because we always want it to be facing the same direction as the entity. And that's a quat. Anytime we get a rotation, that's a quat. But we can construct a three three out of a quat. So matrix three three, and the last one was scale, but we don't need to modify that. It, uh, it should be defaulted to 1, so that's what we want. And then we'll do cam default matrix for our set transform matrix. And okay, there we go. Now we're going to control shift S and then control shift B to build this. And let's see if there are any wonderful errors waiting for me. Oh, oh boy. All right, nice. So I. It always feels good when they build.
So now on camera reset, the position will always go back to where it was when we started and we should have smooth mouse movement now. So, so let's test this out. Let's local Windows debugger and launch this in Sandbox and see what we got. So go to levels, load this example. We still got our player here. In our properties, if we go all the way down, we should be able to see our new options here and we have our camera default position. So the first value here is gonna be left or right. Um, unless you're doing a third person game, you want it over the shoulder or something. Um, I'm going to be doing first, so zero, right in the middle. And the second value here is going to be the Y value. And this is going to be forward and back. So we would want this to be zero if we were doing a first person game, which I am. But for example's sake, I'm going to set this to minus one. This will help highlight an issue that we're going to run into very soon. But lastly, we have this value. This is the height value, this third one. The average height for this is usually going to be anywhere from two to 1.3, 1.2. Uh, in between there, I'm going to do 1.75 so that I can finally fulfill my fantasy of being kind of tall. And we're going to give this a test. So we hit Control G. We are walking around, hanging out in this example level. And everything is great. We have responsive input controls. We have no bugs. We can look around all smooth. Um, we can run into these boxes over there and, and the physics component will work. But if I look over this edge, look how weird this is looking. It's It's like... I'm bending forward at the waist, rather. So if I look over this edge, I am kind of leaping, or, or so it looks. I'm like leaping off this edge. But that's because the pivot for the camera is actually on the actual player. And we want to make it so that on the axis where you look up and down, that it is only the camera that is looking up and down. We don't want the whole character to pivot up and down when we look. So yeah, running into these boxes, as I said, this physics component is clearly, uh, this is a good example of it working. It's interacting with our cylinder. But I want to show you the weird camera pivot you know, problem that we're having. There's a good way that we can visualize this quite clearly. And since we have the advanced animation component as part of our player that we've created, uh, if we go to the right here, we go to advanced animation component, we can actually import the default model that comes with the template, which is why I wanted to use the template. So. Uh, you could do all of this in the blank template, but the reason I want to use this is right here, just so we can show you what is going on. And we can load this model by going up to the top of the advanced animation component in properties and selecting this tiny little folder here named character, and that will open up a select character menu. We'll navigate to objects, characters, sample characters, and we have this third and first person. The only difference is the first person doesn't have a head which is what I want because I don't like heads. I think they're overrated. Um, but if we test this, we hit Control-G, and of course there's no animations for this character yet, but if we hit Control-G and test this epic T-pose, and we bump into these boxes, oops. But if we look down, you can see the whole player is moving down. We just want to look down. We don't want the whole player to pivot. And this is because the rotation of this axis, this looking up and down, is tied to the entire entity. We only want this up and down look to be tied to the camera component while we preserve the left and right look so that the entire entity does look left and right, right? We, we, looking left and right won't matter. It won't look any different if the camera and the character are both doing it. But as soon as we look up and down, that's where the trouble starts. So, and if we jump back into our CPP, we can see that the set rotation isn't for the camera specifically. It's the MP entity. It's the whole thing. What we need to do is separate this out. So we want this whole rotation. We want to apply all of these values to this rotation, but we don't want to apply this rotation to the entity. So parts of this apply to the camera and parts of this apply to the entity. We're going to comment this out and move this down. Uh, this is the important bit up here. This is the entire rotation angle. We want to keep this. We don't want to change this at all. But what we do want to change is what parts of the entity get it. So the first thing is we want our player to rotate on the yaw only. We don't want the player to move on the Y. We just want the camera to. So we'll set an ang three and we'll call this the yaw angle equals C camera create angles YPR. And then we're going to get the entire orientation that we created. So M look orientation. So we're getting this variable that we just set. And we're going to convert this into a matrix 3-3 because it's a quad. So I'll add matrix 3-3 in here. 
we know we want the x to be the same because the x is getting the delta and the speed. We don't want to change that at all. We just want to get the x. What we do want to change, though, is when we also get the y, we don't want the y that we get to have any value because we don't want any movement to be applied on our y-axis. So we're just zeroing out this y and the z. And the z, uh, it's already set to zero. We don't need to worry about setting it again. So we can just not even include it. Then what we need to do is convert this into a quat again. This time, we're actually not modifying the entire variable. We're creating our own specific one for the yaw. So we'll do final yaw. And oh, let me fix this. And this final yaw is going to be a quat. So we'll do equals a quat a c camera create orientation ypr. Then we're going to add another bracket here. We're going to do yaw angle. And that's looking good. Oh, not quite. I got to fix this const here. I spelled const wrong. So that's fixed. And now we can uncomment our set rotation. So if we can just uncomment that. Once uncommented, just change this M look orientation to final yaw. With this, now our player is going to rotate left and right, just like it was before. Now we have an up and down that we applied here, but it's not getting added to anything. When we accessed it here, we set it to zero, so we need to apply it to the camera. So below, we'll go angle three. We'll name this one pitch angle, and we'll equal it to C camera. Create angle YPR, make it a matrix 3, 3, M look orientation. We're grabbing this variable once more. And that's because we want to have its values so that we can modify, or more accurately, so that we can have a copy of those values for the pitch of our camera. So below this, we'll do pitch angle dot X, which is what we don't want to have any value. We don't want the camera to double rotate while the player is also rotating on this axis. So we want this one to be zero. Then we're going to do MP camera component set transform matrix. Well, 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 this is familiar. We did this before. We know that our set transform matrix wants a matrix three, four. So let's make another one above it. We'll do matrix three, four, and we will name this final cam matrix. So what does it need? Well, it needs a translation. So we'll do final cam matrix equals. Uh, no, final cam matrix dot, and we'll do set translation. So we do MP camera component, get position, I think it is. Uh, get, what do we got here? Get entity, get class, no. Get transform matrix, and then get translation. Okay. So it's getting the current camera transform matrix. And then it's getting the translation, which is the position. And that's what we're setting. That way we're not changing it. And then uh, final cam matrix, which is the rotation. This will be a set rotation 3, 3. And this takes a matrix 33. We have a pitch angle. So above our final cam matrix, we're going to do a matrix 3, 3. And we'll name it cam rotation. And this will equal C camera create orientation YPR. We want it to take in the pitch angle. And what does this return? Matrix 3, 3. So we don't need to convert it to a quat or anything like this. We just make it a matrix 3, 3. And we'll set our cam rotation here in our final cam matrix. And we'll close that. I'll leave this, although in here in our set transform matrix, we'll add final cam matrix. And if we didn't do anything wrong, we can hit Control Shift S, Control Shift B. And let's see, fingers crossed. Come on, come on, let's go. That's a build if I've ever seen. Um, so let's load this up in Sandbox, and we'll give it a shot. So let's load this level example, and we have our T pose here. So let's select it. Everything's looking good. We'll play, and if we look down, look at that. Now it's separate. So we look, our character moves left and right, our, our camera moves left and right, but when we look up and down, it's just our camera that's looking up and down. Now that we see that our camera's working, we can actually put it back into this first person perspective and everything should work perfectly. So we're going to go down in the properties here and we're going to move the camera forward again. And another thing that we're going to do is if we go to the advanced animation components, 
and we go to the animation database and select this folder. We can use the preset files for this template. We don't have to create new ones. So we navigate to animations, mannequin, because it's a mannequin editor file, and we go to animation database, ADB, select first person ADB. For the controller definition underneath the animation database, select the folder again, and also go to the ADB folder and select this first person controller definitions. Select OK. For the default scope contact, we're going to do first person character. And for the default fragment name, we're just going to choose the idle. Now, look at that. So, oh, I actually put my camera too far forward. I put it to one. We're going to set that back to zero. And we should see our gun in our hands. So, I'll test it. We can look down. It's starting to look very good, like an actual early access game that people would spend absurd amounts of money for something like this. Anyway, um, we're going to actually see that we have a problem. So if we look straight up and we look straight down, well, the camera does some weird things, right? It's what we want to do is we want to clamp this so that we we set the values in which we want well it to be clamped. So essentially, there is a limit in which the mouse will look until it stops so that we don't reach that perfect straight up black hole where values become meaningless and time stops. So we'll dive into this player.cpp in our update and we're going to do a const float rotation limits min pitch equals negative 0.85f and I'll close that. That's usually a good value and we'll do the same thing for the max pitch. So we'll do const float rotation limits max pitch equals 1.5f. Next, we want to change our rotation angle dot y to equal instead of plus equal. And we're going to add clamp, which is a macro that CryEngine has for you in which you can clamp values. Rotation angle dot y plus mouse delta rotation dot y times m rotation speed. And it's after this M rotation speed where we're going to add our rotation limits min pitch, comma, rotation limits max pitch. Rotation limits min pitch, rotation limits max pitch. We go down to the bottom of our header and we add them. So rotation limits max pitch, rotation limits min pitch, and we'll add float M underscore to the beginning of these. All right, so now they're members. And we'll add our description. So add member, uh, brackets, ampersand, C player component, do M, uh, uh, which one is this? This is the rotation limits max pitch. Yeah, so rotation limits max pitch. And for the short abbreviation, we'll do CPM. For the name, we'll give it camera pitch max. For the full name, uh, we'll do camera pitch max again. And for the description, we'll just do maximum rotation value for camera pitch. For now, we'll just end this in zero. We'll copy and paste this whole line and change all of the relevant lines from max pitch to min pitch. So rotation limits min pitch. Uh, for the abbreviation, we'll do CPMI. Uh, we can actually do four letters here uh, is the maximum. So anywhere from three to four for this one. Uh, camera pitch min, camera pitch min. Uh, we'll change the description to minimum rotation value for the camera pitch. So um, this will also end in zero, but actually this is not going to end in zero. We want to take these numbers that we have, the minus 0.85F and the 1.5F, and we want to place them uh, or replace the corresponding zeros that we have in these ad members with those values. So the min pitch here is going to be negative 0.85F. And for the max pitch, we'll change the zero value to a 1.5F. So I can delete these from the update because we have them set. And here, um, let's see, rotation limits, min pitch. Uh, we'll do M underscore. I didn't add those M's. That's kind of important. We need to make sure those member variables are assigned. Uh, what else? I think that should be it for the clamp. 
We'll build it. We'll see how it builds. So control shift B. Fingers crossed it is a successful build. We'll launch this in sandbox and we'll see if the clamping worked or if the clamping broke something else, which I hope not. So levels, we'll do example. We'll check it out. Uh, we have our idle character just chilling. So if we go down into our properties, you'll see that we have our values that we can set, but they're at zero. And we want these to match the numbers that we've assigned in our CPP. So for this first one, we'll try the negative 0 0.85 or 8, I guess 84. Um, I guess it's not going to matter in a sec because you'll see um, I put these in backwards. And if we do this, well, it freaks out and you'll notice it right away. So just make sure that they're in the right way. Make sure the min and the max have the right numbers uh, in the right spots. And that's it. You can look around and you can see that this camera is now kind of maxing out. You, can, you can't look totally straight up. Um, and that's perfect. You can always adjust these if you don't feel like it's, if it's too little or too much clamping. Um, so now we have a player, right? This is great. We can walk around. We can look around. We have clamping. Um, there's so much other stuff we can add. We could add uh, EKIs so that our gun moves when we look up and down. We could add jumping. We can add sprinting. We can add animations to our characters. And there are tutorials for some of these. So there's some pre-existing CryEngine tutorials out there that are helpful for these things. Brian Dilg did an excellent tutorial on importing characters and adding animations to them. So this is great. We have a game so far. Um, it's in early access. It's one easy payment of $185. So anyway, you can actually go into your solution folder and your code folder in your CryEngine project directory, and you can copy those into existing CryEngine projects if you want to load this same player component in your project. So if you didn't build this in your existing projects, don't worry. You can just easily drag and drop, and you'll have this player in no time. This is a great foundation. I'm glad that you stuck around, and congratulations, you deserve a solid pat on the back and a job well done. So catch you next time, and thank you again for joining.